I won't I won't kind of eat into tonight's time any any further. Um, just to set the scene, um, Harry and I are sat in a hotel in Stratford. Harry's presenting at the Smart Hort um, conference in, in Stratford on Avon. Um, so we're in a broom cupboard um, with our laptops um, ready to, to do tonight's webinar. Um, Harry's going to be covering uh, machinery, um, capacity versus cost, and kind of and all the different kind of um, aspects that you could be looking at. Um, he'll go into much more detail now. Harry, thank you very much for taking the time out of your diary to do this. And um, at this stage, I'll, I'll hand over to you. OK, thank you, Richard. Right, good, good evening, everybody. Um, much of this presentation, much of this uh, webinar is going to be uh, running through machinery costs that we found through the machinery reviews that we've had done on the Monitor Farm Network. Um, the, it stretches, the Monitor Farm Network stretches from Cornwall and Truro right up to uh, nearly Inverness, across to Essex, Pembrokeshire uh, and, uh, and Northern Ireland. And you'll see many of these costs will, uh, will, will appear um, from a, a, a huge range of farms and a huge range of farm businesses. I'm not expecting to tell you what size of tractor you should have. Um, I am expecting you to gain an opinion of what machinery size and, and capacity you should have on your farm. Um, and it's something that you can decide. Um, every farm is different and uh, every person is different and some like the, the newest machinery possible and, uh, and some are happy with, uh, with more machinery that's uh, of a more second-hand nature. So we'll go through the, uh, through the agenda. Um, it says. There we go. Uh, go through the agenda. Um, I thought we'd look at uh, the last 50 years of tractor sales and horsepower sold in the UK. Quite some interesting facts and figures there. Um, the machinery investment on farms. If you Google this, you get a DEFRA report, would you believe, on the machinery that's been spent on farms in the last 10 years. Um, the AHDB Monitor Farm Machinery Review will go through and the, the whys and wherefores of that and who we got to uh, help us do it. Um, total arable costs found on the on the monitor farm, and then we'll go back into into greater detail operation costs in uh, various parts of the farm, and we've got some quite some detailed uh, costs that we'll uh, we'll produce uh, as we go through um, on drilling and cultivations, crop protection, sprayers in particular or uh, exclusively really, and uh, and combine harvesting costs as well. And uh, we'll pick up some learnings from what we've done what, uh, from the uh, labour and machinery reviews and some final thoughts, really, before handing it over to you for some questions. But as, um, as Richard says, do ask some questions if, you, if there's something that you've got a, a, um, a, a burning question for, do just uh, type it into the box and we'll, uh, we'll answer it as best as we can. I thought uh, we'd start in January of this year the uh, National Statistics um, um, Group published this um, report of machinery investment on farms in England, not in Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland, just in England. And uh, it's got some fairly, it's, it, there's a lot of data in there. There's a lot of charts and graphs and figures and facts and figures, and you, you're welcome to look at it yourself. But I thought the three highlighting uh, findings for, from, uh, from this report were that what nearly two billion pounds was spent uh, last year, 2017, 2018, um, on farm machinery. Uh, three quarters of it, 79% was spent on new machinery. Um, an average across all farms in England, the average expenditure was 36,000 quid, just over. And perhaps the, the, the thing that might not have, um, might not be a surprise to you, but you've never really had it confirmed that in re real terms, after adjusting for inflation, the um, average amount spent on a new wheel tractor has increased by 65% um, since over the, the last 10 years, and um, uh, that's quite an that's quite an increase, and that's adjusted for inflation, not in, not in, including the inflation. I think if you added the inflation as well, it gets to 88%, and um, so that's a steep increase on uh, on farm machinery, and we know that that's gone into uh, into steel prices, rubber prices for tyres and emissions controls as well that's been passed on to the uh, you, the consumer. Right, a bit of a busy slide this, but um, if you look along the bottom, you'll see the years ranging from 1964 right up to 2018. Uh, on the left hand side, we've got the number of tractors sold within that time frame. You can see uh, the blue uh, line. 
the green line is discounts the number of tractors sold but added all together it's the um the amount of horsepower sold over the last 50 odd years 50 54 years or so and you can see that uh, you can see the way the economy's gone up and down you can see that uh, in the year 1976 was P for potato, if you remember, and, uh, and that was a big spike there. Factories couldn't produce tractors quick enough to, um, to, to get them to farms, and there was a waiting list of over 12 months. Then it slumped into the 1980s and, uh, and then picked up, um, got to its uh, lowest point in about uh, 1998, and I just out of interest really dug up the feed wheat price on April 27th, 1988, and it was just 69 pounds a ton. Um, so uh, many of the uh, the meetings at the HGCA were putting on at the time were saying, well, if you can't make a profit out of that wheat, don't grow it, which is which is, uh, which is hard cheese. The other thing that appeared there was the McSharry report, and you can see there's a bit of a change now. The, the horsepower sizes started to grow, the um, the numbers of machine tractors sold into into UK farms um, say it's plateaued out, but it's it's similar to where it was uh, today than where it was in, in 1998. So the point of this one is that in 1964 there was about two million horsepower sold into the into the UK farming industry, and in 2018 it was the same two million horsepower was sold. Um, obviously the uh, the the tractors have come down and the horsepower per tractor has gone up 62.8 in 1964 average horsepower which was a Ford 5000 or so and uh, the average horsepower now is 166 uh, horsepower uh, each um, each tractor sold in the UK so there's been quite a range or uh, quite a growth in the amount of power being consumed on the on UK farms so we thought it was high time really to run a labor and machine review and if you became part of the Monitor Farm program, we would have offered this to you. Um, we tendered out uh, agricultural consultants and, and received tender applications to, to run this kind of work because we couldn't do it ourselves. And uh, it was Strutt Parker that was successful in, in getting that job. So they have visited probably 23, 24 farms um, across the country and took all the same data down and have crunched it through into the facts and figures that you'll see shortly um, and all in a the similar uh, fashion so um, they've 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 hopefully produced the the same facts and figures for all across all of the the, the monitor farms for you to have a look at in a minute we stipulated that the machinery reviews should include a review of each machine with a with an engine um, for each machine cost should be separated into depreciation repairs interest insurance total standing cost whilst it's sitting in the shed before you uh, use it uh, total hours per year and then total cost per hour because uh, we want to apply a cost per hectare but of course before you put an implement on a tractor you, you're not giving it a um, an output in terms of work rate we would then um, do the same thing to each implement and uh, of course you can then add because we have a work rate of a given implement we can give it a cost per hectare and an operation cost per hectare finally um, based on the combined machine and implement labor fuel cost and calculate on the work rate of, uh, of the operation in hectares per hour on the on the farm so it's quite a detailed um, uh, calculation um, and the depreciation um, I'll probably mention uh, a couple of times through this it's on a straight line basis so we consider the value of the machine coming onto farm we consider how long it's going to stay on farm we consider how much it's worth when we come to move it on and then we divide that um, figure between uh, and across the, the years that the farm will uh, the, the tractor will stay on the farm so it's straight line and it's important to know so right i've said that so we'll move on and um, yeah, we'll produce a labor profile for each business as well. And we'll, we'll have a, a slide on that uh, towards the end. Um, this is the sort of information that we were coming up with. And you can see this is, um, uh, there's a lot of data here. Just start with the top one, total arable machines depreciation cost in pounds per hectare. 
and across the monitor farm network you can see that the, the lowest appreciation is just four pounds per hectare and the highest is 120 and it okay it, and it um and you um you have to wonder what on earth is this guy doing with just four pounds per hectare is all of his machines uh, near near and gold plated or, or or so old that they're going up in value and what on earth is the guy doing with 120 pounds per hectare of depreciation across his machinery fleet and we'll try and put some answers into that as uh, as we go you can see repair costs uh, run from 20 pounds to 62 um, and that's a, a a good range as well you know it's more than tri triple the the lowest rate um, and I suppose in hindsight we should have done repairs which are breakdowns and maintenance which is something that you do in the winter when the machines um, not being used um, but all the repairs are, and maintenance are lumped in together in these costs as well and you can see fuel uh, minimum fuel cost pounds per hectare 28 pounds for uh, arable cropping up to 86 and um, whilst you could sit there and say well yeah the 86 pounds a guy has got uh, heavy soil and he's plowing it's not that much is it between 28 and 86 so there's an awful lot of range of uh, of costs that we encountered as you can see here and i won't go in through any more we'll go down into a bit more detail into the into the operation costs so again we can see the green is good uh, red is is less than good um, you can see that individual operations, drilling, plowing, pressing, cultivating, and that includes power harrowing, subsoiling, rolling, spraying, uh, fertilizer, granular fertilizer, should say, and combining and carting. Again, the top one, really, <clears throat> you can see drilling at £16 a hectare and the highest at, uh, at 63 So there's really quite a huge range there. What's... Uh, We'll we'll make mention of the uh, of the um, the two differences in machines, and we'll probably tell you what uh, what machines we're going to use. I will say we'll talk a lot about um, about uh, the makes and models. Um, I'm not adv advocating that you should buy one make and not advocating you should leave another alone. I think that's uh, something that you you'll need to, to discuss with your own farm team. Um, and it's more the concept. It's the concept of um, of uh, cultivations of harvesting and the size of harvester against the the area that you have to to cut and you'll see there's quite a range of um, of, of machines with an awful lot of work to do and there's a couple of combines with with that have a fairly easy life but of course that will uh, increase the cost so so that's that's the cost there was um, rolling I'll pick out as well we did wonder um, what on earth the guy with uh, four pounds a hectare was was using, and we did wonder what the the guy with twenty one pounds a hectare was using, and I can say that the the four pound per hectare charge for rolling it was a, a Fent um, five one four pulling a twelve meter set of rolls across over five hundred hectares of of ground, and the the guy at, uh, at twenty one pounds a hectare had a, a John Deere uh, 6190R with a six meter set of rolls um, pulling it over I think less than 300 hectares so there's always differences of connotations so it doesn't mean to say that the guy at 21 pounds a hectare needs to um, buy another tractor that's of a better size he's probably using that uh, the, the 190 horsepower John Deere for other work and uh, it doesn't warrant him buying a, a smaller tractor just to, uh, to get his prices down on rolling so there's always a, another story behind the uh, behind some of these costs, but we'll try and put some uh, some emphasis on on the, the combination of these costs later on. This is the Pembroke Monitor Farm readout of of, uh, of information. So you can see how we've presented this in many cases. We've got a Case Puma 165 uh, pulling a Vardastat, um five meter Vardastat, I believe, and you can see the cost per hectare there panned out to be 24 pounds. The average monitor farm cost came in at £30.10 per hectare. The Central Association of Agricultural Valuers thought the job should cost £32.85 and contractor charge comes in at just under £60. And um, so um, Pembroke Monitor Farm does pretty well on, on cost. I think on everything he is below the average apart from uh, 
carting grain to to store using his case puma 145 um he's got a, a self propelled chafer and you can see that comes in to a very cost effective um, setup for spraying so he, he does well the bottom part of the slide is this is cost of operations and you can see for wheat um, for the whole cost of operation in machinery and labor for growing wheat per hectare comes in at 228 pounds monitor farm average is 191 and he fares fairly well at nine tons a hectare five-year average yield so um, it's it's a, a credit to him so we'll move on one of the things that we've come up with um, the, the sort of workshops that we've done with monitor farms have been reviewing establishment costs and what we can do um, with uh, with reducing establishment costs and so we had a farm in Lincolnshire um, it's now finished as a monitor farm now but we ran this this um, uh, uh, review through him and he wanted to reduce his, his cultivations and so he was on nearly 1600 hectare farm and you can see he's got the quad track uh, 485 and a Guagua Besson uh, semi-mounted 12 uh, for a plough and that was really quite cost effective at 38 quid um, then he would potentially go in with a, a, a quad track again Rexus Press 17 pound 70 working down quad track again 485 7 meter top down I can't think what what width this, the Rexus was I think it was 7 meters as well drilling at uh, with the quad track with the Vardastat RD 800 at 26 pounds 15 and then rolling at 9 pounds 31 now that's quite good for establishment costs as you'll see in a minute but what he had done had lost the battle on black grass and uh, he, he he felt very strongly that it was his battle against black grass was rotation related he didn't have enough uh, spring crops and i don't think he had any spring crops at the time this is probably five years ago now i guess and uh, he resolved that he needed to in, introduce spring crops into the uh, into the rotation and so much so that he might have to go spring crops back to back in order to get a flush of black grass spray it off get another flush of black grass and spray it off again so the reduced income from his rotation meant that he needed to reduce his um, his costs and he saw cultivations and crop establishments as one of the primary um, opportunities to reduce cost across his rotation so went into reduced till uh, gave up the plow as much as he could and you can see the costs went down to 63 pounds 24 per hectare for uh, for drilling but wanted to move on a bit further as well and you can see he wanted to get into strip till drilling thought that was that was the way forwards uh, kept the quad track bought a nine meter sumo DTS uh, drill and a, a stubble rake 12 meter stubble rake and I think he did buy a, a strike a, a sumo strike pulled it with his existing 7530 with uh, and that romped along with a 12 meter strike up, up and down dales he's on a world's farm so he's able to manage the, the hills no problem and and went into uh, straight into um, uh, um, strip cell drilling and you can see the uh, the effect it's had on his costs um, the nine meter drill is fairly stiff to pull in in good soils in in heavy soils it takes about 50 horsepower a meter so we're looking at 450 horsepower uh, tractor to uh, to pull it so the case quad track was only just powerful enough to pull the machine up and down dale um, which was a benefit in some ways because it pegged the tractor at speed at about eight nine ten k at maximum so um it it kept the speed down it kept the soil wash from the from the drill down and produced a really nice finish uh, finished field um, as it as it went through so it worked for them they got uh, they got the establishment costs down to to less than 50 pound which is a which is a some achievement i've got to say um, they are still concerned that uh, the quad track is a little bit heavy um, they've moved on to 12 meter combine and there are the 36 meter tram lines so it kind of uh, begs towards forming a, a type of control traffic but the drill a 12 meter drill is just a killer it's a killer to pull and it's a killer to buy so the thinking is that they'll migrate towards two six meter no-till drills pulled by 250 horsepower tractors 
to to get across this kind of uh, kind of acreage. Um, that will remain to be seen. They feel that their uh, the soil is um, is is in conversion and building up more uh, organic matter, and uh, they'll move to to no-till if and when they can. Harry, I've got a, a question specifically about tractor. Um, <clears throat> I'm Gary. My current dilemma is I have one tractor doing everything and um, covering 1,200 hours a year. Should I be running two tractors and keeping them longer, do you think? Um, well, I think it depends. We, we, Richard and I were at uh, the, the Old Wales Farming Conference in uh, just near the Gower Peninsula a couple of weeks ago. And as a guy proudly said, he put two and a half thousand hours on a tractor in a year. I don't know what he does, and I don't know whether all of that work is is profitable or whether he's just driving past his neighbours in it. But um, I think it's down to personal preference. If you're happy taking implements on and off the tractor, and that's not too much of a bind, then I'd say keep the tractor doing the hours, turn it over regular. Um, you'll be able to afford a, a reasonably comfortable tractor um, sooner. Whereas if you have old, older tractors or you keep them longer, then you will incur more costs into the business um, because you've got two engines on the farm. And um, so I'd say stick with what you know and stick with what you have. Uh, it's very tempting to get another tractor and it turns out real handy when you can just jump right into the yard, get off one, jump on another, back out again real soon. But um, if you... If it's it's the right way, if you want to keep your tractors fresh and keep them turned over, you know, and put five, six, maybe up to ten thousand hours on it, you'll you'll um, you'll do it much quicker, um, in uh, with with holding on to one tractor. But it's going to be down to your personal preference, really. If if you find that taking machines on and off of the single tractor is a real bind, then it's something you need to think about. Thanks, Harry. Right, we'll go on to the, uh, to the next slide. I can't remember what it is. Oh, yes, I know. So um, now then, this is a bit, bit of a busy slide. What we've got here is 20 farms along the bottom. And these uh, green um, uh, columns represent the size of the farm. So we've got 20 monitor farms listed across here. And the numbers on the left-hand side in green represent the amount of hectares that we've got in the in the the suite of monitor farms that we have across the country. So you can see one guy's over 1,300 hectares and one guy, farmer at 11 at the bottom, is just 126. So there's a pretty good range of, of, of businesses across here. And uh, what the numbers are, the blue lines, it doesn't really show a trend, but I just wanted to, to, to highlight the range of costs that, we, that these monitor farms are incurring. So if we start at farm one, you can see that his, his establishment cost to run at about 160 pounds a hectare. The next one um, is 91, next one along 78. And so can you see uh, any um, uh, economies of scale? Um, not really. Um, and there's another point we'll get across, I think uh, quite a bit at the moment is can you uh, see any economies of scale coming from the very biggest farms right down to the, uh, the very smallest. You could argue that the guy of uh, uh, Farm 11 has, uh, is, has got some cost of £237 a hectare, um, but he's not the highest. Um, there's 288 on Farm 14, but there's a, there's a big old range. Well, the, the two farms I think I'd draw your attention to, or probably the three farms, is uh, farm nine at 43 pounds a hectare and he's at just on 500 hectares uh, farm 12 is less than he's about 370 odd and he's establishing his crops at 32 pounds 50 pence a hectare that's pretty good and we'll we'll discuss him in a bit more detail in a minute and then there's farms 19 and 20 you can see uh, 20 in particular uh, 81 pounds a hectare and 41. So as we go through some of these graphs, you'll see a bit more uh, likely. You'll see that these farms will stay in the same order, and you can go back and look at these guys and see what their spraying costs are and their and their combining costs um, as we go through. But that's the establishment costs. If we put a bit of detail onto these these guys, um, you can now see what we've got uh, the line along the bottom, subsoiling in blue, 
plowing in green, pressing in yellow, cultivating, which could be um, spring thyme or power harrow, um, power harrowing on its own, drilling, everything from no-till to uh, reduced till, power harrow drill combination, and of course rolling at the, at the very end. And so you can see the split of operations going on across the across the monitor farm network. And um, I guess quite quickly the 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 um, the two farms that uh, you were drawn to is farm nine and twelve. Well, I can tell you farm nine is on a sandy soil, uh, sandy uh, soils, goes in with a fent. Big fent, nine nine thirty fent, and a five meter McConnell discorator off the top of my head, and has got a uh, a smaller fent and a four meter horse CO as is his drill, and then he goes on and finishes off with with rolling it. So very effective, very speedy way of uh, of of getting a crop established, and this is all usually based on wheat, I should say, and um, so. And um, we have got figures for establishing all seed rate, but we thought we'd just for the sake of simplicity, we'd um, we'd stick with with wheat. The farm 12, you can see there, he runs a John Deere 7530, fitted with duels all around, and runs a 4.8 meter Claydon uh, linkage mounted drill, and straight in with the drill, drills it and rolls it, and I think he's got a John Deere 6622 to roll it and. Nine, six or nine meter rolls so you can see it, it works very very well for him he's um he's uh, um, built up a lot of organic matter and um, so the trap tractor is usually able to travel pretty well he's got a bit of um, bit of a window in terms of conditions which you can go on but he is a real attention to detail sort of guy. The duels go on no matter what. He doesn't want to flatten his um, his headlands down by turning round. Of course, some of these linkage mounted drills are, are heavy to pick up. Um, I should just mention the line across the top. I was going to mention it um, uh, as I left this slide, but I'll just let you, let you work that one out. It is the five year average yield for all of these farmers. So you can see farm one is doing pretty well. He's, I think his average yield across the last five years for feed wheat is 11.3 tonnes. And farm 12 is none too shabby at just over, over 10 tonnes per, per hectare. So do reduced cultivations reduce um, um, yield? Which we don't see that. We're not seeing that. It's more to do with the attention to detail, I think, placed on it. The, unfortunately, perhaps there are no true no-till farmers here, although I will mention there is a guy that has a no-till drill in his set, and I'll just mention him in a minute. Um, but we haven't got any real true no-till no -till enthusiasts on, on the set uh, of, uh, of monitor farms here. Um, I think I should just mention Farm 14. That's a little bit unfairly represented in that he's put all of his operations in and he's got the highest cost of ploughing. You can see there the big green um, column is his ploughing costs. They pan out at £97 a hectare. And what's happened here is he's, he's been included, but he's uh, all of his operational costs have been included, in, been included in his crop establishment but uh, he doesn't necessarily use all of them. It might, his, his plough is a, considered a, a reset button for black grass control, and it's a, and it's a good plough, but it's rarely used. So his subsoiling, again, he, he doesn't use all of his subsoiling all the time. So again, the costs have gone higher because he doesn't use it across all of the land. Um, pressing, that's not, not necessarily uh, an option for him. He, he, he doesn't necessarily need to use it. And the same with cultivating. The important bit is, and he's incurring quite a bit of machinery cost in his drill, that he runs both a Sumo DTS, a four meter, and a Sumo DD. And the trick is here that he's got his, um, both of those drills could be pulled by a Fent 818, I think it is off the top of my head, um, or a, a, another tract of similar power. He can run, according to the conditions, he can run the DD if it, the conditions are right. If they're not quite right, if they're a little bit more damp or he needs to make a bit of a scratch, he can put the uh, the DTS in as well or instead of. So he's got that ultimate flexibility between um, uh, strip-till drilling and, and no-till drilling. 
So it's a little bit unfair, really, to, to give him all of that costs, really, because um, he doesn't need to incur them at all. So um, um, that's, a, that's a, just a bit of an anomaly, some of these kind of uh, detail throughout. Harry, can I ask a couple of questions there? Yeah. Um, this first one, you might, we might have to come back with the answer because I'm not sure if you have it to the top of your head. Um, do you know what the average hours per year for the arable tractors were over the data set? Oh, I might do. Um, I'm, I've, I think it's about 700. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 700. There are guys doing 1500 hours a year on some tractors, um, but there are people that their drill tractor does 200 hours a year, and it goes back into the shed, and um, and it sits there. It never comes off off the drill. And there's been debate at Monitor Farm meetings whether that tractor is worth having. I can tell you it was a John Deere 8530, um, comfortable tractor, auto power transmission, RTK on it, so perfectly capable machine, 10 years old, um, but does 200 hours. Now, as long as the owner is happy to take the risk on the fact that it's breaking down, it's cheap horsepower. It's pulling a four meter um, Missouri Pro-Till drill and it pulls it a treat and it's no problem at all. Um, the risk is that the tractor's his and the the, the the perceived thinking was that he should hire a tractor in. But we looked at a, a, a tractor of a similar horsepower, probably not not as much either than 270 horsepower rather than 330. And um, it would cost out more to hire the tractor than to, to run it. So a long-winded way of saying 700 hours, I think, was the average. Thank you, Harry. Um, Another question here: um, Does the, the the kind of the, the model or, or plan of purchasing a new tractor, quality brand and with a good resale value, uh, with a five-year or two and a half thousand hour manufactured warranty, and then selling it after four years, so it still has one year left on the warranty, make business sense in your opinion to keeping the same tractor for ten years or more, averaging five hundred years? Very specific scenario, but averaging 500 years, 500 um, oh, hours. Per okay, year, sorry. <laughs> um, um, I think we'll, we'll get into this because ownership is a very interesting thing. Um, it depends on the payments. So if you want to shift the tractor on and after four years and you're still making payments on it, and the dealer salesman will come down and say, Well, that's great. What we can do is put a plan together for you, we can maintain the payments, and you get a new tractor, and we take this tractor from you, and it's worth more money and um and that will be all tickety boo well okay but it's probably the highest cost you can you can have the tractor for it is risk free of course because you've got a manufacturer's warranty on it and uh, and that's that's very good for for um, reducing your risk but if you're going to own the tractor it's probably more sensible to own it for another four years so you keep it for eight ten years even and take the risk on whether it's it's going to go um, go, go down on you um, and uh, uh, build up a, a fighting fund for your next tractor. Um, you, it's, it depends on your attitude to risk. If you're if you haven't got staff or the time or the inclination to deal with a tractor that's gone down on you, then the, the manufacturer's warranty is a good safety net to have. If you want to own the tractor, ultimately and you are relaxed about the risk and you're not thrashing your tractors um, then uh, and, and they don't seem to be breaking down on your farm as much as what your neighbor seems to think then i'd opt for keeping it for a longer period of time assuming that you want to save money same person just said he paid it off in three years no super duper yeah hang, <laughs> hang on to it then i mean if you paid it off on three years then then it makes sense if you shift it on after four or five years then yeah you, you you can you can do that keep it maybe um talk to the dealer and and see what they say because uh, the dealers like to to bring in nice tractors in order to move on they don't really want to bring in, in machines that are uh, uh, going to be bothersome for them to move on does that manufacturer's warranty have much value in terms of the resale value of the, of the kit yeah i think um it gives the next person coming along to buy it a bit of peace of mind that he's going to get a year's protection and um, so it does have a value. It's a bit of peace of mind for the for the new purchase of the second, yeah. the, the next owner. Yeah. It'd be hard to quantify that value. Don't yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Thank you, Harry. Okay. Um, oh yes. Um, going back to the slide, 
uh, Farmer 20, you can see right on the on the right hand side. Um, the he is a plow and combination power harrow drill man, and nothing else. Well, a bit of rolling on top, as you can see. Um, the this guy runs a Fent 930, big seven furrow semi-mounted uh, Lemkin plow with mounted press on those presses that you see on press arms that swing over uh, with the plow. Um, and he bores along at, uh, with this plow at a pretty good rate. You can see he's probably got some of the lowest cost of plowing that you can get, even though he's got pretty good tackle. And the drilling operation is a another fence, a 936, I think even, with a six meter front mounted hopper and press and rear mounted um, power harrow drill combination. And this is spread across, I think, approaching 900 hectares. And you can see his, his costs are below 100 quid um, for a weatherproof form of, of plowing. He's up in Scotland, so uh, a bit of weatherproof crop establishment is important up there. And uh, he gets on very, very well. Easy working soil, I will have to say. He's not he's not plowing at horses' heads that have been compacted down. It's it's uh, it's it's relatively easy working. So the seven furrow plow and the six meter power harrow work together um, to uh, to form a uh, weatherproof uh, uh, scenario. Um, so it's interesting just to see the split of uh, of of costs across operations. But you can see that. If you're looking to reduce your costs, there's an awful lot of, of um, costs that you can reduce here without harming yield. The caveat comes, of course, that uh, the time spent out of the tractor seat, power harrowing and, and cultivating and, and subsoiling, so is probably spent more so um, maintaining some attention to detail uh, and making sure that uh, the, the job's going right. Um, it, it is a true saying: if it's um, well sown, it's half grown, and that's th that's that stands the case here um, if you can get it uh, well established any crop with the right system then uh, then it certainly does it work pays dividends you can see there's not too much leeway in the yield but there's an awful lot of leeway that people can be had in in terms of uh, establishment costs right we'll move on oh yeah we'll go on to work uh, on to crop protection there's been lots of debates raging on twitter lately about uh, whether a trailed machine is is more cost effective than a self-propelled um, and we'll, we'll add some some detail into this um, it's again it's very much down to the operator and you'll see some of the the machines that we have listed here we'll go into makes and models of, of crop protection I wasn't going to do it with seed drills because it's more of a system the seed drill but of course your crop protection is performed by one machine so we're able to to add makes and models and, and so on into that Again, uh, yes, I've got the John Deere photograph of a nice John Deere into mossed rape. I'm not trying to sell the thing to you. <laughs> it's entirely up to you what you what you want. Right now, another busy slide. The same bars, the blue um, bars are represent self-propelled machines. The green bars represent uh, trialed, and then there's one lonely um, Amazon UX sprayer, I think, and Amazon uh, front-mounted tank. In, in the middle, and it's our guy with the lowest um, establishment cost, you may remember. So um, so the dots, you can see the little dots and the, the bar or the, the um, axis on the right-hand side are the size of sprayer. So it's fairly stable, as you'd expect, 24 meters, you can see for the first four sprayers, one, two, three, four. Then uh, farm five has got a 30 meter, um, farm 6, 24, back to 30. But you can see the relationship, the amount of hectares that some farms have and use a 24 meter spray. If we go to farm 6, the biggest um, farm, 24 meters, 24 meter tram lines. And then we've got, shall we pick on farm 14, uh, something like 500 hectares, and they've got a 30 meter sprayer. There's one anomaly perhaps in farm uh, 19 that uh, has got a 27 meter trail sprayer but so can you see a correlation between farm size and uh, trailed or mounted or self-propelled no uh, i think it's entirely down to the farm operator um, and i think it uh, is something that uh, some farmers like to have like to be able to see the crop and 
you know the uh, the, the cost of, of having that may be uh, may be beneficial to you. Um, so that's the spread of, of machines that we've got um, across the the monitor farm network. What we'll do now is we'll go into looking at the trailed machines, makes of the tractor and model of the tractor, age and sprayer and the hectares it covers and the cost that uh, it uh, incurs as you use it. Ah, I forgot that bit. The um, the costs here we've got, you can see, um, starting from the left-hand side, farm one is five pounds a hectare, two is again five quid, three is four pounds a hectare, and then there's a couple of spikes. There's a couple of um, uh, machines where we've got farm four is 11 pounds a hectare, and farm 19 is 10 pounds a hectare and we'll go into some detail and try and explain what's what's going on with there but you can see between the four and five three and four pounds and up to seven pounds is about the width of the of the costs of operating a sprayer that uh, you can you can see there and uh, with all the numbers uh, included so there you go there's some detail on some of these sprayers um so this is the, the Monza Farm network. I'm not going to reveal where they are or who they are. It doesn't really doesn't really matter to be fair. Um, just going through the rationale, we've got the year of the tractor, which is important, the year of the sprayer, the width obviously, and the area to cover. It doesn't I I agonized or I tussled with this a little bit if we need to um, include the amount of area that the sprayer covers in, in given the whole year, whether it's gone through your crops four, five, six times or not. And I thought well, it's, it's just going to get a bit unwieldy. So this is the hectares of the farms uh, total. So this is the, what the combine would see if he's the top sprayer you can see tackles uh, 362 hectares. And that's what the combine will see. Um, clearly, these machines have gone through two, three, four, five times um, according to uh, whatever kind of farm, farming operation you run. But... Uh, um, I thought we'd keep it at the, the the area, and you can make your own minds up about how many times these machines would go through a, a an arable crop um, uh, rotation. So I've put them in order of cost. So you can see the cheapest machine, unsurprisingly, is the Amazon uh, mounted machine with front tank. Um, it's on a, a John Deere 6620. Comes all the way from 2006. The sprayer is is was new in. Uh, 2012 24 meters covers 362 hectares in its uh, in its day-to-day uh, -day job and comes across tractor fuel um, uh, sprayer um, and all the, the repairs and depreciation all up man sat on the cab depending on whether you're you're the business owner yourself or whether you're paying a man to sit in the cab it doesn't matter um, comes in at three pounds ten unsurprisingly um, you know, you might think, well, okay, well, there's a lot of old tractors in here and the, the costs are fairly low. The depreciation has got low. But if you remember, we did it um, in a straight line depreciation basis. So there, it's not curved. It's not that the, the, the 6620 is finished. Depreciating is now slightly going up. Um, or uh, uh, some other older machine, the 68, 68 uh, John Deere, you can see 1995, that's not going up. It's split across the whole age of the um, of the tractors. So are these just the cross crop protection costs, or if there's liquid fertilizer in there, is that separate? This is just machinery. Yeah. So this is just the price of operating the machinery. What you run through it is is up to you. Um, and I don't think I have uh, have um, uh, the whether we know whether we we put liquid fert through these machines or not. I think we can make. We can make value that some of them are, um, but we'll go from there. Um, where was I? So the, th well, the point I wanted to make was that it's the incoming price of, let's pick on the John Deere 6620 in 2006, was fairly low compared to today's standards. Um, if you buy 130 horse by John Deere, it will be substantially more than the 6620. Um, and that's what's having this downward effect on the cost per hectare. It's the incoming price at, um, where the price to pay, the price you bought it, um, is 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 having the effect on it. So it's not so much its age; it's when uh, the value when you bought it. Same with the sprayer, and you'll you'll see this um, 
um, come through again. Um, so it seems that John Deere tractors are the, uh, the crop protection tractors of choice, and then there's a whole range of, of machines. Um, I did agonize whether we want to put the repairs and maintenance builds against these sprayers and, and tractors. Um, people are very interested in whether the, you know one maker tractor is more reliable or more cost effective to run than the other. And I dug a bit into this, and then you find that there's a there's a, a repair bill on a tractor, and you talk to the owners, and they say, well, okay, well, yeah, um, we did have a big repair bill, and you say, well, what happened? And I say, well, it wasn't my fault that the gas gun got stuck under it and tore the hydro hydro pipes off it. I say, well, okay, well, that's not the tractor's fault or the sprayer sprayer's fault, is it? So. I decided not to go down that route um, because uh, we couldn't separate what was operator error, unfortunately, and what was um, was tractor build quality or sprayer build quality. And we'd be sat here arguing the toss, and it would be uh, a nightmare to uh, to unpick. So we'll just leave that for now, I think. Um, I've got a question here then. It's slightly looking at the wider picture, Harry. Yeah. How, in your opinion? How do you think these figures would be different differ if there was no basic payment scheme? Ah, well, um, the general perception is, if you talk, we, we've, we've done a lot of work with Strutt and Parker. They're believing that um, the basic payment scheme will be cut by 50% if we're lucky. If we're unlucky, it's going to be 75. And, um, and I think these figures, these figures are on the screen right now aren't scary um i am going to get to some scary figures um but um i think frankly these are okay yeah um but there are some scary figures out there and uh whilst i think that you can still buy a new tractor without um without the basic basic scheme, payment scheme how you have it and how long you have it is going to change mm. And a man that paid our, the, the, the tractor off in three years um, may not find he'd be able to quite do that unless he resizes the tractor that he's using. So, so as you said, interestingly, um, how do some farmers make the premium brands pay tractors pay for themselves? I think that's a comment or a question, really. Um, you can get the premium tractors to pay for themselves, but you can't have a big premium tractor. And... Um, it made me smile when you, you go and see a, a Fent 1050 and uh, it's got a pickup hitch on the back of it, which is a 500 horsepower with a pickup hitch. I'm sorry, but you know, you can't effectively use a 500 horsepower tractor and no. you have a pickup hitch on it. Do different brands depreciate at different rates? Yeah, um, yes, you'd say there's probably more a demand of a premium tractor um, than there is of the less so, but uh, are we in the business of farming or are we in the business of trading on on farm equipment let's say i don't want to pick on a track particularly but if we buy a zeta crystal at 160 horsepower it will last 10 years um if it pulls a drill um and you accept what you paid for it and you accept what you will get for it um you probably pay a little more money for a fent or or something else of a premium brand you'll get more money for the end but um, the dangerous bit is when you put premium bells and whistles on a premium tractor. So you've got your heavy duty front linkage, belt line, xenon lights, turntable fenders, bi-directional PTO, and don't use any of it. Then, unfortunately, you're depreciating this type of machinery on behalf of the, uh, on behalf of the dealer who will have a lovely tractor to sell on in five years time. So you've got to make sure that the tractor you're buying, you're getting that... Um, that um, uh, use from your you're using a vario transmission it's nice to have but is it a business essential or do you need is, is a power shift transmission just as good i won't keep you much longer one more question <clears throat> in your opinion again what acreage do you change from a contractor to do your to do your spraying considering cost of machinery now and adding more hours to your own tractor again um i think that's a that's a well I think the first question is, do you like spraying? And if you think, oh, not really, no, then that's that's a pointer towards a, a contractor. Um, can you have a have you a contractor in the area that you have a good relationship for, and he's got a good reputation, and you think, well, I could just sit with him over a cup of coffee and say, okay, I'll hand over my area to you, and 
the agronomist, if you have one, works with you and the contractor. It, we have monitor farms. A Driffield monitor farm used a contractor entirely. Um, didn't like spraying, didn't want to get involved, but did the crop walking, um, interestingly. And um, that was absolutely fine. It was a, it was a, um, it was a match made in heaven. Um, there was never ever any trouble. The, these, these, all the crops got sprayed. The, the farmer himself was a real attention to detail guy and, and got milling quality every time. So it can work. But I think it's, it's, it's finding the, the contractor that you want to work with, sitting him down. He might have to buy or upgrade what he does if he's going to get your land. Um, but you can see that you can spray. These are the cheaper com um, spraying combinations. And you can do it yourself if you want to. Thank you, Harry. I won't hold you up any longer. <laughs> okay, let's go, let's go on. Ah, average uh, monitor farm uh, trial sprayer cost £5.55 from all of these machines. Um, I'll just pick out the, the bottom, the sprayer at the bottom at £10 a hectare. What's happened there? 6830, 2011. It's pretty pretty nicely depreciated, I guess. Or it's, it, it came in at a, at, a, at a reasonable value. The um, the sprayer is relatively new. These these reports were done in the back end of 2017, so the sprayer is relatively new. And this guy has got 341 hectares to, to the sprayer cross. So it's the combination of a relatively new sprayer, 27 meter, I think it's a 4,000 liter tank. So it's a pretty well spec sprayer. Um, he's probably suffering from not quite enough um, a hectares to, to use it across. If you'd up the hectares, then he'd, um, he'd, he'd, the cost would drop. But we'll say about gaining scale to drop costs in in a little while. Right, let's crack on. Let's get on to uh, self-propelled. And uh, the shocking thing is that the cheapest machine to operate is a self-propelled sprayer. Um, but only because it was built in 2005, 24 meter. It's got a fair amount of hectares to go at, 524, and comes in at two pounds eighty pence per hectare. Fuel, depreciation, driver. Um, everything in apart from the chemical and um, to operate across that farm so it's the combination of a of a of a good value machine plenty of hectares for it to go at comes in at two pound eight just for 20 pence more bateman self propel five years older machine now it's 18 years old this machine but again touching 500 hectares to uh, to go across 24 meters again Housem, 20, 20, 2013 Housem here another good amount of uh, hectares another pound deck a hectare for a, a much more uh, modern machine. Again, similar machine here, and it depends. You can see we could we could pick holes in the fact that the 2012 machine seems to be more expensive and have more hectares underneath its belt, and is 90 pence more expensive. But it depends a little bit on your own valuation of the the Housem sprayer and when you want to get rid of it. So that detail isn't shown here. It might be that. Um, that the uh, the 2013 housing is being kept for longer for 10 years instead of seven and that's the effect it will have on the the cost per hectare rb55 bateman 2015 at 30 meters again probably uh, five pound 40 um not got the greatest amount of hectares under its belt but the sands 20 20 uh, 10 sands 30 meters approaching 950 hectares approaching a thousand hectares at five uh, five pounds seventy, and again, it's that valuation of what you think it's worth. And I have to say, it's it's not very scientific. It, and sometimes it's a finger in the air. What's your sprayer going to be worth in five years' time? And uh, you just hold your finger up in the air. You can depreciate it ten percent a year, and you get somewhere close. Um, you know, after five years, and it, or you want to keep it longer, it might be less. Um, but uh, um, so there's a little bit of anomalies going on with the with the valuations as you sell the machine. Question for Clive Bailey. Hi, Clive. How Hello, Clive. would the cost look if the comparison of a self-propelled at current prices versus these old machines? So, for example, a um, 110,000 trailed versus a 250 self-propelled, same spec over the same acreage. Yeah, it's, it's a good point because what we're lacking with these machines is some new ones and all of the sprays you can see on this screen are the machines that traditionally cost between 70 grand and 100,000 quid in uh, in 2005, 2000. And of course, sprayers have gone, or self-propelled sprayers have gone up in value exponentially. They're, um, 
they're now not like many of these machines maybe not the rb55 but the the ai the air ride um three six 24 meter it'll do might do 18 miles an hour now we want 40 or 50k we now want four and five thousand and six thousand liter tanks um and we now want um 36 meter booms and so suddenly you're getting into a machine that's costing you know a quarter of a million quid weighs you know 13 tons empty and with all of that they you want more chassis you want more engine that you've got to have better brakes on all of those costs are passed on to the uh, the um the operator or the the purchaser very quick question like really quick one because i realize i'm holding you up um with the spray costs have you taken into it have the the, the time to take to refill the spray has that been taken into account uh, that's a very good question because that can have a huge effect on the output of your sprayer getting it sitting a bowser at the end of the field rather than it trailing down the road to fit up a yeah, view to and from that shed could be that's a, a very good question and i don't have the answer off the top we of your head come back to this question and we can come back to that one. yeah we will we will we will um i cannot remember but yes the the uh, efficiency usually is about 50 50 percent master switch on and can be 65 if you're really going for it so the other 35 percent is either filling master switch off turning around and so on um let's go on to the next we've got quite a few uh, machines to go through so we're getting a bit up, up on the cost here how's a merlin um 2014 700 hectares to uh, to spray six pounds 40 so things are creeping up these are a little bit more modern machines sands horizon 30 meter 55 uh 2016 uh, just under 500 hectares to cover, £6.73. Big old Agrifac, 30 metre, uh, just under 700 hectares, £6.80. Sands Horizon, £7.42. You can see for yourself where this is heading. There's a few anomalies here, really. The 24 metre Agri Buggy at, at, um, at uh, 24 metres and a 2012 build suffers from not having enough hectares underneath its belt. It's got 222 hectares, and so if you were to give it another 100 hectares that eight pound 70 would come down to within uh, within a reasonable amount i know that the agri buggy lives on hillsides and um there's a there's a certain desire to use a self-propelled on hillsides rather than a than a trailed and um, there's a reputation that trails tip over um and we've all seen photographs floating around online of, of machines sticking up with a with one boom sticking up in the air and and the wheels up in, on their side um but you know there are other sprayers that go across some horrendous hills self uh, trial sprayers and they they seem to survive another anomaly really is the the 1995 night self propel 24 meter sprayer and again suffers from not enough hectares to to spray but of course that's up to the the business owner if they really feels he needs a night um self propelled with with four wheel steer to turn out of his potato rows as i know this farmer does then then he's got the sprayer that he wants. Yes, he pays for it, um, but um, it's, uh, you know he takes your choices. Um, and Hausam 4,000 litre 2014 machine um, is uh, again, it's uh, it's a new machine, and you can see where this is heading. That if you haven't got enough hectares to to spray 425, then you end up paying 11 pound hectare for it. So. Clive is right. Uh, Housem is far from the cheap, cheapest um, spray you can buy. If you want to go um, over the channel, there's much more expensive machines you can bring in. And um, it's going to be, it's the engine and it's the emissions and it's the size of engine and it's the size of machine that will, will push the price per hectare up. So the trailed um, argument and the self-propelled argument, I think um, it's, it's difficult to bring another a machine on with an engine onto farm if you don't need to and if you have a tractor that is going underutilized on the yard that can pull a sprayer and it doesn't have to be a brand new one with isobus connectivity you can fit the isobus kit you can fit it to the 68 john deere if you really want to um but uh, the the trail is tending to be a more cost effective purchase at the moment be simply because it hasn't got an engine 50k disc brakes and all the other paraphernalia that go with it i know there's probably people that say well yes but i can't go through the mud holes with with a troll machine because the axle is not driven um but is that the problem of the sprayer or is that a, a drainage issue in the field so uh, i'll leave that one with you before i get shot down in flames <laughs> <laughs> um 
the average cost of the self-propelled sprayer is six pound thirty-three, so it's about a pound a hectare more um, as we see it. But you can see that there's some really cost-effective self-propelled sprayers that are bringing the cost down for the Monitor Farm Network. Right, we've got 10 minutes, but I'll over a bit of crackle. Um, right, we're going to do combine harvesting. This is one of the combines in, in question. Um, again, this is the 20 farms in, in question. You can see uh, the numbers on the left-hand side of the hectares. The numbers on the right-hand side and the green line represents the header width per farm. And you can see if we take number one farm on the far left, for an example, just under probably 550 hectares and he runs New Holland with a 7.3 meter header um, and you can see that there's there's a, a number of nine meter headers out there there's just three 10.5 meter headers out there there's a 9.5 and the smallest one is six meters at farm number eight which also um, you can see that's where that line comes fairly close to meeting where um, we've got a six meter header with, well, what, 700 hectares of crop to go at. So that's a busy, busy combine. Moving on to costs. Um, there are the costs. So we've got some interesting figures here. Um, again, starting at number one, 41 pounds a hectare, pretty cost effective. Farm three also at 43, and we'll discuss the difference between those two. And then we look across really, we've got farm 13 at 92 pounds a hectare. Uh, farm 18 at 97 um, so there's a good range of, of, um, of costs out there we began to think that about 60 pounds a hectare was pretty average but you can see we're, we're kind of dragging that uh, average down and it's probably closer to the 50 pound a hectare mark to, uh, to, to aim for if we look at the machines in question and again this is in order of cost you can see that interestingly the, the, at the top the cheapest combine to operate has been the, the New Holland CX8060. It's not owned by the farmer, it is rented and I suspect this, far, this machine has gone, gone back to the, uh, to the owners now but it was rented at just £41 a hectare, uh, 339 hectares to cover and worked well. Um, it was looked after by the, the hire company um, all the, the, the farmer needed to do was put fuel and a driver and oil and water in it and daily checks and uh, off you went. Cheap, cheap combining. Another surprise is really is a John Deere S670 single rotor combine with a nine meter header is owned and bought in 2014. And that also comes in at I think it's about £41.40. So it's not quite the cheapest, but it's pretty close. Very similar hectares to the... Um, the um, the CX you can see there and a slightly wider header. I don't think John do recommend a, a, a nine meter header on this combine. It'd go for a, a, a 7.5, but it's only going to affect the forward speed. To be fair, and the, the hectares per hour will uh, largely stay the same. So it's again, it's up to um, owner owner preference. To be honest, um, I think the the thing to point out here is that. Um, the it was bought well in 2014 and the plan is to keep this combine for 10 years so the the depreciation has been spread over 10 years and so that works very very well uh john deere t660 it's 25 foot cut comes in second uh, an older uh, class 570 is next t550 that machine with um, i think it's a t550 i think there's one where we've got a lot more for it to go at um, 50 pound Massey Ferguson, the, the eight walker style Massey Ferguson machine with a 25 foot header, 362, 50 pounds, um, uh, 40 to, to operate. And then we get into some bigger machines here, um, 770 TT with a 10 meter header, uh, just over a thousand hectares to go out at 52 pounds, um, at a lot less, uh, nearly, nearly, or more than half the 670 TT with a bigger header. But it's a, an older combine, 2011 at 56 pounds. You could see, imagine if you gave that a thousand hectares to do, it would it would cause the price to to plummet. Do those 41 pound a hectare figures include the driver hours? They do. Yeah, you're putting a driver in there as well. So yeah, and um, the new Holland is driven by the farm business owner, and uh, I'm not sure about the John Deere. I think there's an employee um, paid to drive that. Mm. 
Going up in the, the cost stakes, um, plenty of class, combines at 570, 570 plus, and you can see the cost of creeping up a little bit. Uh, the biggest combine we have in the suite is the um, class 780, 10.5 meter header, new in 2017, good level of hectareage to go at, 1,200 hectares to go at, and comes in at um, 67 pounds, just shy of 68 quid a hectare. Still, um, the the average contracted price is 88 quid. Uh, we found so it's still cost effective harvesting. But you see, it's got a, an awful lot of, of hectares to go at. That particular machine was um, thwarted by an average field size of 25 acres. So. Um, I should think operators are fairly well versed at taking the header off. And I know it's down um, down country lanes and the header has to go on a trailer. You can't just bob it over the, the, the top of the gatepost. It is, uh, it's, it's nothing short of a ball lane. Um, going up in the cost, we'll skip forwards. John Deere Walker Combine, six Walker machine. You can see uh, 78 quid a hectare, but the machine is capable of more than 288 hectares. Um, but, um, um, you know, that's what uh, that's what you get. Um, you, you would probably go with a with a smaller machine if you, if you needed to, but you know they could opt to keep that machine longer. It's running light, then it would last. Um, you know, it's all of these machines are quality machines. They'll last 10 years and beyond. Depends whether you want to to do that. Um, the CR9080, um, just shy of a, of a thousand hectares to go at, um, 2014 machine. Um, and 85 pounds a hectare. The anomaly perhaps is the axial flow, and I think there's a bit of a discrepancy here in that it has more hectares to go at. It's a shared combine. Um, it was uh, it's shared between a neighbour, and I think we've only included the 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 owner's land, and he goes off and puts another 200 hectares under this combine which would bring the cost down from 92 pounds. So I think it's just a little bit of an accounting issue there. And, you know, a good accountant can make any number you want work. And and I think this is the case as well, that the, the actual flow is not necessarily an overly expensive machine, but it's um, it's just it's not where we haven't quite counted up all of the hectares that that machine counts. And the um, class 760, um, I won't go into detail, but this occurred some fairly major um, repairs and uh, and has, has put it at the top at £97 a hectare. And it's a fairly biggish machine. It is capable of more than um, 500 hectares. A question here. Is there any value put down for a, for being over capacity and a lower, lower drying cost and retaining quality of the crop? Well, that's a very good point because when we we kind of thought there was that there's a value in getting a bigger combine going out at uh, 11 o'clock in in the morning rather than thinking you need to be out at nine o'clock in the morning um, catching um, uh, grain whilst it's drier and in better heart. Um, some rudimentary calculations that we've done if if you if we think it takes one pound to take one percent out of uh, one ton of moisture, and I think that's a conservative estimate. I think people have said, no, no, it's probably closer to one pound fifty, one pound seventy to take one percent out of one percent or one ton of of uh, of wheat. Then you could be incurring, if you get a ten ton crop of wheat, you're looking at ninety pounds a hectare of drying costs. And so the immediate thinking, well, that will go a long way to get a bigger combine. And we ran this idea past at um, one of the Dorset Monitor farms, and the combine driver himself stood up and said, well, that's bloody rubbish, because all you do is end up with the yards full of undried wet grain, which you can't handle. Mm, OK, yeah, because um, you, you've still got to have some drying capacity. So, yes, it does pay to have a good bit of capacity, but I don't think it can save you from not investing in drying capacity. Because like our, our combine driver said in Dorset, you just end up with piles of wet grain everywhere that you, you now know not what to do with. So it's a balance, really. Yeah. Right, I can't remember what's next. Oh, yes. Um, if we've got the smaller combines, we did, we did a, a, a workshop with the Pembrokeshire Monitor Farmers, and they've got a... A, uh, a smaller machines if you thought the class 780 was was way out of your league then these probably hopefully fit the bill a bit more uh class Decano 430 had a, a hundred uh, 320 hectares to uh, to tackle 
came in cheap really 28 pounds 93 cost per hectare um probably a blast from the past and for some of you was the the tf yes twin flow 76 new holland combine three hect 300 hectares that go out 42 pound 14 john deere um z series 2254 with just 100 hectares to go out cost at 75 quid so is it worth him getting a contractor in well as long as the, as long as the machine gets looked after and it hangs together probably not um and right at the bottom is a is the john deere um, 1450 only 75 hectares to go out and i think the john deere for something head would have a something like a 16 14 or 16 foot cut a header on it and it's 67 quid so it's would you say it's within budget could a contractor do it for less money than that i don't know that the contract will be happy being paid that money so as long as these smaller combines and smaller hectares uh, are, are well looked after and they're well serviced and you you don't park it outside and you, you you investigate anything that's rumbling then these combines will hang together and and provide um uh, cheap combining got a question here why are these john deere's more expensive per hectare yeah sure go back um john deere's the there's the john deere there w6 walk six six walk combine um i think it's just capable of more crop and it it would probably tackle 400 hectares so it's it's not um you know it's it's that's why really it's 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 in the position it's in and going back again the ooh, the john deers i mean to be fair to the s670 that's coming in very cheap and the t660 has got plenty of hectares it's got um uh, to go at so that's coming in cheap as well so he's talking about the second slide the pembrokeshire ah oh. Oh, that one um i think it's it's probably not got enough um hectares to go at yeah. if you had 175 hectares it would be it would be 50 quid and below yeah. okay um right we're coming to the end um yeah we'll um, what we think we'll do we'll uh if you want to calculate your own cost i realize that you might think well this isn't relevant to me, but it, I hopefully it's given you a, a sense of the cost that you uh, uh, see across other farms with a range of machinery, new and old, and uh, and hopefully that you know you can you, we would like you to go away and calculate your own cost of machinery. So if you Google HDB machinery cost calculator and hit enter, you'll get taken to this page where you can either download a slightly more um, uh, in depth calculator it's a spreadsheet and you can put the combine in the hectares it's, it covers the years you want to keep it for its value you'll buy it for the value you think it will be worth after how many years you want to keep it for and it will spit out a cost per hectare same for sprayers same for drills same for tractors and you can um, you can sit there with a cup of coffee and just manipulate the figures if they don't work first time around you can keep it longer or you can think well i'm just going to drive the price down a bit either with the dealer or i'll, I'll see if he's got a, a cheaper more more um, more cost effective machine so yeah so that's that's a way of really of uh, calculating your own cost we've had loads of questions harry and i'll try to spread out who we've gone to because i can see the names here no I can't. Um, so, we, <laughs> so we, we obviously um generates a lot of interest there's one here at the end saying do you think there's any value in in looking at the, the adding the liquid fertilizer to the sprayer equation to kind of see the differences there that that makes it is um it is um the the, the, the debate will rage on i think forever with about between liquid fert um there's a couple of standout points that if you go to liquid fert have you got the sprayer capacity to get round your fert and your spraying i know some farmers feel that if they've got a spinner going independently of the sprayer then they can get across a lot of land in a in a, a short place, space of time rather than hoping if you're putting liquid fert on and you're putting fairly decent rates on your sprayer can only put on four or five hundred liters of fert a, a, a hectare so you're pegged on speed um then you're putting the machinery under some pressure the fertilizer is harder on a sprayer and of course you, you you're effectively adding probably a third extra to the the amount that the sprayer is running there's more maintenance costs come in there's a bit more care and attention you need to wash it more often um, and so it's a little bit horses of courses you can make the sprayer cheaper 
but um, it depends on your system. If you if you run out of capacity with your sprayer and you can't get um, T1, T2, T3 fungicides on at the right time because you're out putting fertilizer on, then you're just sitting in the cab thinking, well, this ain't much fun. And you'd be missing dates. And then when the agronomist comes around and says, how you got on? And you have to admit to him, you're not not very well. <laughs> um, wait, this is the last question, Harry. We are running over now. Um, a lot of these figures can be done when planning planning a purchase. So you, yep. you can to be kind of looking ahead a bit more and yep. budgeting and planning. But when you're planning to a tractor purchase, how would you estimate that uh, figures such as the fuel use, repairs, insurance, depreciation? How would you go about getting those kind of figures for your own situation to make a, a kind of valued decision? I think um, despite the manufacturer's claims, it, your current tractor is not that fuel inefficient. And the next tractor coming in is not that going to be gut-wrenchingly more fuel efficient. So the fuel consumption that you're using right now won't be that far away from what your next tractor will be. So um, record what fuel you're putting into the tank and, and record it when you've done a job. Um, and it could be power harrowing, plowing, whatever you like. Um, and, and calculate your fuel use from there. The new tractor isn't going to be that far away, I would argue. I guess the manufacturers would be jumping up and down saying, oh, yes, it is. But uh, you, you, you can get a, a reasonable uh, rule of thumb from that. Oh, God, I'm stuck up for punishment here, but two more quick questions. Go on, yeah, yeah. Um, I've been told that we should, should have one horsepower per hectare for all self-propelled agricultural vehicles, excluding the combine. What's your comment on that? Well, I think you'd be known in the parish as Ebenezer Scrooge because um, <laughs> because I think you'd have to put a loader on your tractor. You'd have to sell the telehandler to get your horsepower down. Um, you'd have to sell the other tractor that's hiding in the shed for spare um, to get it. I can say that the, the lowest horsepower per hectare in the monitor farm uh, set was 1.5 horsepower per hectare, 1.4 even. So there isn't a farmer that we know that gets to one horsepower per hectare. And uh, as you've seen, we've got a good a good range of uh, farms going across the, the whole range. Finally, it's just about the figures that we've looked at today. Um, Tom's asked, have or will the HDB be publishing the ranges that we've been looking at of, of these figures? Um, is there... Um, Obviously, going to state that this is quite fresh in information as well. We've it is. just finished it. It is. It is. Um, well, it will be published on this webinar, yeah. so um, the, the the information that you've seen will be put on onto YouTube. To a certain, yeah, it's going to be to a certain degree because they're not our our, um, our figures, really, are they? No, no, no. True enough. We're not going to do any naming and shaping. So, um, <laughs> so the the figures that you've seen will be published. Um, we will continue to use these figures to to give direction. Um, to, uh, to to people that are looking to buy machinery um, and, uh, and to, to allay their fears or to create more fears, uh, however, however, whichever way you want to think about it. So, yeah, we we'll probably will, yeah. Good. Well, thank you, Harry. Well, I, I think we, we have gone over there and, and you've had plenty of questions. So um, th thank you very much for taking the time this evening, Harry. I'm sorry to have pulled you out of your conference for for, for this hour and a half. No, it's um, fine. Take you away from your dinner. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, if you want your basis and erosive points, either put them in the question box or email the, the details to me. Um, the webinar will be recorded um, and it'll go up on, onto the HTB YouTube in the, in the next week. And again, any feedback, please let us know what you'd like to get out of these webinars because they're done for you and I'm happy to, to put that into place. Harry, thank you again. Really good evening, really good webinar. Thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you again next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.